it is a foregone conclusion and a reality of life that you're going to face conflict. Whether you first ran into conflict when you were born and you discovered that somebody had swatted you on the butt and you started crying, since then you've run into conflict, things that didn't go according to the way you thought they would or the way that you may have assumed that life was all about. Principles of life, we discuss conflicts. We don't discuss them in the way that just simply identifies them and says, oh, well, you know, since you're born in gravity, you're in conflict with the laws of gravity, so you're conflicted immediately. Well, that's true. But that's part of what life is. Life is the direct relationship of conflicts. You are conflicted by the reality of living in something that is not in agreement with the normal laws of creation. And that's what you are. You are in conflict with the laws of creation. You are in conflict with what God made in the beginning. You see, you're an aberration. You're not according to the will of God or the design of God. You are a, quite frankly, alteration of what God intended from the beginning. But God planned accordingly for that. Because you see, even in that aberration, that alteration of God's will, God so designed you to be able to endure conflict, to be able to go through this process of changing from corruption to incorruption, that you actually became a part of God's greater plan. And that's why we can look at conflict as something positive and not something negative. Because God has made a way where there seemed to be no way for you to find the way to be in conflict and yet still be in accordance to God's will, doing exactly what God wanted you to do, even in the midst of the challenges you're facing in life. And that's why we look at principles of life, because we discover that there's more meaning to this world than what we can see, touch, or feel, and that there are certain elements to life that exist within the reality of our day-to-day process of pragmatic living that we can put into practice as we go through life in a very precise and insightful way that we can make important intelligent decisions based upon the principles that we learn of how to deal with conflicts because you are in a conflict both physically emotionally spiritually and the spiritual conflicts are always talked about. They're pretty simple to understand. They're those things that we always talk about when you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but a principality, power, spiritual wickedness, high places. Those are the easy ones to say, oh, well, of course. Yeah, that's conflict. Hey, that was easy. Or you think of yourself as being in conflict because, oh, I got saved and, you know, immediately, you know, my family wasn't saved, so we were in conflict. Now, those are the easy ones. But there's more to life than just the immediate identifiable things that you say, oh, well, it's all external things rather than I'm in conflict. Because you see, I could be in conflict with myself. And if I'm in conflict with myself, then I'm in conflict with every other relationship that I face in life, whether it be with God, with man, with my wife, with my children, with my job, with my situation, with my emotions, with my spirit, with my physical being, with my soulful being, with just the reality of all that I am. And so we discover that God has principles that we've taken from Scripture and they've been assembled and put together in a pragmatic way, a practical way that we can look at that the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts with Bill Rother did in researching the um, principles of life. And those are things that we use as our foundation in order to look at the scriptures from an in-depth perspective and then say, yes, there is logic to this. Yes, there's meaning. Yes, there's purpose. Yes, there's a design and a designer behind what we can do with our mind as an intelligent, rational being that knows to use the mind of Christ and be willing to open up our expansive process of thinking so that we would incorporate the spiritual aspects of life, not just into the practical, but into the entire being of what we are, both emotionally, physically, and spiritually, in all of our life, to have a complete picture of what God intended in this thing we call life. 
And so we've been looking at what the benefits are of going through conflict. What are the benefits of the problems that we face? And how can we get the greatest benefit, the greatest reward for our enduring these things we're going through? Our endurance race, as it were. Our learning process, the things that we've encountered and we've made applicable to our life. How can we get a benefit out of these? And we've looked at, kind of as an introduction, the fact that most of us want quick solutions to it. We want to drive through Christianity. We want everything to happen now. Boom, boom. Give me the ABCs. Give me the quick notes. Give me the shortcut. I don't want to take the long way around. I want to get there immediately. And, quite frankly, I said, hey, you want to get rid of your Bible? Fine. No problem. I got one scripture for you. You want to get rid of your discipleship material? No problem. Fine. Put it all aside. If you want to get rid of every other purpose under the sun, every other issue that you would deal with, I can sum up for you in the quickest, shortest amount of time possible the one thing that you can hang on to for the rest of your life. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Piece of cake. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He'll sure, he shall direct thy path. But when you start to take apart that trust, what is trust? Who do you trust? How do you trust? Where does trust come from? Are you trusting in these different areas and everything else? You'll find that you don't. And then, do you trust in the Lord, you know, and if it, with all your heart, or is it with, you know, just part or this and that and the other thing? And then you get into all the aspects of it and you'll find that, okay, the simplified isn't as easy as the long version. The long version sometimes is the easier way. So, really, the synopsis of just doing a short version in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 sounds good, and you will be living it the rest of your life, but you'll still be living it and learning it for the rest of your entire life. But we've also discovered that the reason why we're supposed to take a lifetime to learn these things is so that we would learn discipline, self-discipline, discipline in life, structure, organization, skills that are meant to be a part of our life as we grow through the phases and the stages of our life, as we get older, as we were younger, as we develop in our relationships to different types of people and different circumstances that we run into in life. And we went over also the procedures that we should use in order to solve those issues that we face whenever we come into conflict with those issues of life whether they be in a person, a place, a thing, or a people, or a relationship, or in church, or in ourselves, or in our immediate loved one's circle. There's those areas we identified that we said we hide from God because we don't want to deal with them. We don't want to be pressured. We don't want to deal with what the one thing is that God said we should be wanting more than anything else. And that's to increase the pressure rather than decrease. It's like a steam engine. You don't want that pressure to go down. You want that pressure to stay up. So you're constantly stoking the fire to get the fire hot enough to heat that water so that that steam that as it goes into the, the combustion chamber, as it drives the pistons, you know, and it drives the pistons back and forth, and you get the choo-choo-choo-choo. It's like a choo-choo train. And you're just chugging down the road as long as you keep that pressure up. You know, that you have to have a constant pressure on you in order to keep that train moving down the road. Because once the pressure drops, then you're like a locomotive without steam. You're not going anywhere. And so we need pressure in our lives. We can't avoid pressure. We can't be devoid of pressure. We need that as a constant in our life. And as we recognize that there must be direction for that pressure and for that conflict and for the ability to hear, see, and understand, we acknowledge that it must be the Spirit of God teaching us and guiding us because without Him, there's no way we would understand where to begin where to go, how to get there, like a map that we're following. You know, you can't just reevaluate it and say, oh, well, I think I'll just make my own way, and then try to reschedule what the map shows based upon what you think is this a pretty picture. Let's put it over here, and let's put the road over here, let's put the mountains up here, and then try to follow it. No, we have to go by the way it's designed. And that's what the Holy Spirit has in our life, a design and a pathway for us to go. So we have to go according to the designer. And then we know that the Spirit of God hovered above the waters at the beginning of creation, so that God had sent him again in order to lead us and to guide us and to fill us and to direct us. So now we've gotten to identifying the five benefits that we can get from our problems as we face them head on, as we deal with them 
by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, directing us, guiding us, not avoiding them, not trying to get a shortcut, not trying to do it without pressure, not trying to you know, escape from under the realization that God is in control, but rather to draw out all the little nuggets of wisdom that we can get from the situation that we're in, the conflict that we see, the very essence of the relationship that needs to be resolved in some way. And those five benefits were one, the benefit of getting more grace from God. Two, the benefit of self-examination. Three, the benefit of new insight in Scripture. Four, the benefit of unifying the family. And five, the benefit of uniting the families of the church. Tonight, today, now, as we are, where we are, or even this morning, we're discussing the benefit of getting more grace from God. You know, I love the word grace because everyone has a different definition of it. I'm always fascinated by that. You know, it's one of those things that, you know, it's like people say, oh, well, it's a merited favor. Well, that explains a lot. <laughs> Something you don't deserve, you know, you don't get what you did deserve. It's like, no, that could be a present that was withheld. You know, I mean, sometimes I don't get the definitions because when you define something, most often, if you look in the dictionary, you'll see a little number one. You know, look up in the dictionary, you know, if you, if you do books instead of iPads and, you know, kind of trying to use an app for a shortcut to get to some web page that's, you know, 16 pages long and you're going to go look at it from a short page, you know, application that only shows you two pages. But when you get a chance, you know, look in a real dictionary or look in an in-depth expanded dictionary of what grace is and you'll see a number one sometimes a number two three four five six the different applications of what grace is by way of the explanation of the usage of the word depending upon where it's used and how it's used one of the things i do in uh, in integral specificity is i try to designate to the integrity of the scriptures themselves by way of using them in the context with which they are located and the interlocution of that location designates how that definition should be used and applied according to where they are, as they are, the way they are. That's my personal um, thesis on systematic theology and I don't go by systematic theology, I go by integral specificity. It's just my own point of view. But having said that, looking at the scripture then, our definition of grace will always apply to how we're getting a benefit of getting more grace from God if we even understand what grace is. So we do really have to take a comprehensive picture of that. Grace, of course, normally is applied to that area of salvation where we talk about, oh, well, you know, it's law versus grace, or it's works versus grace, or it's something that God did for you that you could not do for yourself because you couldn't save yourself, so God's saving you, and he's saying, okay, you know, this is grace, now you got it. Well. I decided after listening to all the world's definitions and a lot of people in theology and Bible scholars and teachers and everything else huh, about grace, I decided that I needed to do a series of Bible studies on grace. So I tell you to go check out the videos, but uh, videos, but uh, you know, the series is going to take a lifetime to do because boy, have we confused grace. Grace was simply at one point in time in the area of kingship. It was, if you pictured in the Old Testament, the book of Ruth, you know, you get a better idea of where grace, or the book of Ruth, the book of uh, Esther, you get a better idea of what grace is. Because you see, women didn't have equal rights like people talk about in America. You know, people talk about their rights. You don't have rights, really. I mean, if you got back down to it, boiled it, simple, you're either a child of Satan or you're a child of God. Your rights are gone. Sorry, <laughs> you think you got freedom? Not quite. It's not the way you think it is. Freedom is the ultimate realization that you are under obedience or in disobedience. One of the two. Because you can't be free without there being that opportunity to be one or the other. Either in obedience or out of obedience, which means disobedience. So you're either, Jesus said yes or yes, no, no. You know, anytime that you answer the question, are you in God's will? Well, where do you go? Yes or no? So you see, it's either one or the other. It's never kind of like a gray ground that we make up in democracies and freedoms and privileges and rights and try to confuse the issue by making something apply that doesn't really apply. Because spiritually it's not true. So 
The fact of the matter about grace is simply that God, in the form of one of the books in the Old Testament, gave us a beautiful picture of that by showing us what it was like when Esther decided to visit the king without his permission. You see, the king, in those days, if you didn't have the king's permission to come before him, then you were killed unless he extended his scepter to you because of his own decision-making process. He could choose to extend grace to you by giving his favor to you. His favor meant that he accepts your entrance into his presence. And that's the way that it was in King's days, even in the King Jameth days, or in the King's presence. It's kind of like, I can't think of an area where we would be given that opportunity to exercise grace in America, because we really don't get much of it. You know, it's kind of like taking an SAT and they say, well, you could take it over again, sort of. It really doesn't apply. But the point being is that in the king's presence, when Esther decided to come before the king, then the king had to, first of all, acknowledge her and see her and say, oh, I know you, that's Esther. I, you know, what she wants, if she knows if I don't like say something, she's going to get killed because my guards will haul her off. So he ex when it came time for her to present herself before the king, she, he extended her his scepter, this kind of like rod thing that he had that he kind of you know, made sure that that was his power, his position of authority was all wrapped up in the scepter that he held, which represented the authority that he was as king. And so when it was extended, then the person could come forward and touch the scepter. That's kind of where the Catholics get the idea of kissing the ring, you know, for the Pope about submission and authority and all those things. Americans don't do well with submission. They don't do well with authority. That's why there's so many issues in Gentile religions that have such a problem with grace and with obedience and with law and then with legalism and with sovereignty of God. And so in that area of the king extending his scepter, that would be called grace. You have found grace in my sight. A lot of the Old Testament uses that about loving kindness and about his mercy. Because you see, the active part of grace would be mercy and loving kindness. Because of his loving kindness, his mercy endures forever. His mercy would be extended outward to the person who is receiving grace as the object of what he's doing by allowing the person to come into his presence. So the object of grace was through the manifestation of mercy by his loving kindness. If you use that, defining it that way, then when you say God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in should not perish but have everlasting life, you would say God's loving kindness was extended through mercy so that grace could be given to those who would trust in the Lord, uh, trust in Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Trust in the Lord. So, in a lot of ways, if you redefine it for an Old Testament way of looking at it, then you would say the loving kindness of God was extended in that, that's a little word, you know, in that the, His mercy was manifested in Jesus, that grace would be extended, you know, through the act that Jesus did, which was, of course, we all know, to die on the cross, to suffer, and to be resurrected by the Father, accepting the sacrifice for our sins, both past, present, and future, in the fact that He found favor in God's sight. You see, grace had to be extended even to Jesus, though He fulfilled the law. It says that He found favor. He found grace. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So, God could have determined at any time whether to extend grace or not, and a lot of times people mistake grace for what God does for what man thinks he gets. Kind of a mixture of the two things aren't really all well that defined sometimes by people that are abusing grace. And it's not all that well defined by sometimes that people are using grace. Sometimes you just have to accept the fact that God gives you grace and that you didn't deserve it in the first place. And so, defining grace will show you whether you're abusing, using, confusing, or living grace. Because grace has been given to you for one reason, one reason alone. That you might extend grace to others. You're never given something in order to keep it for yourself. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. Just God is not selfish. God is selfless in the sense that Jesus himself thought it not equal to be God, but emptied himself 
you know, and became as a servant, that he might serve the will of the Father by doing his will, and that God has given him a more excellent name in that, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow our tongue to confess Jesus Christ, Lord, glory to God the Father, you know, and all that stuff. But the reality of all of that, summing it up and putting it together, is simply that, hey, he was given it in order to do what God wanted him to do. You're given grace in order to do what God wants you to do. And what does God want you to do with grace? Give it. Meaning, if you're judging someone, you're not giving them grace. If you're hurting someone, you're not giving them grace. If you're challenging someone, you're not giving them grace. What are you doing? Then, is your grace in vain? Could be. And as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. You not giving grace to someone after you've received grace is the same parable that Jesus said. Now, a servant was forgiven of his debt, and he had many debts. And so the master said, I'll forgive you your debts, you know. But then after he was forgiven, the servant went out and called his servant and said, Oh, you owe me. Pay me now. And so he didn't extend grace. And then the master of that servant came back and said, What did you do? I gave you grace and forgave you all your debts that you owed me. And then you go out and beat your servant? Forget it. I take it back. Boom. Throw you in prison. Hey, for those that say grace is always there, dare I say you need to relook at the scripture. Grace is given that you would extend grace. But be careful how you use that grace. For if it's used for licentiousness, if it's used for lawlessness, if it's used for sin, <coughs> and you do those things, <coughs> according to the scripture, you didn't have it in the first place. Grace is the extension of the action with which God wants to create in you the loving kindness and the mercy that he's given you. And that he can do that by way of his Holy Spirit reliving through you the same thing he's done to you. Did you get that? He extends through you the same thing he's done to you. And that is mercy, love, and grace. So you want to get all the benefits you can out of grace. But the benefit that we get is the success of our lives is entirely related to how much grace God gives us. Jesus said it this way. Who will love the Lord more. He who is forgiven much, or he is forgiven little. And the disciples said, well, that's easy, man. The one that loved that was forgiven much. This is well said. And grace is extended to us insofar as we find ourselves falling at our feet, or in our on our faces, at the feet of Jesus because we realize what sinner we are. Jesus starts off the Sermon on the Mount the same way. Blessed are the poor in spirit for those who came to God because they recognize their poverty of spirit. They recognize how much they need more of what they don't have. And the little bit they do have, they implore to have more. And that's why more grace is extended when you ask for more and how God wants us to recognize just how much grace <laughs> we have been given in the very fact that should God have even one moment decided, I'm not dying for him. Forget it. There's one guy out there I ain't dying for. I've had it. Then, of course, grace would be of no effect for us, and we would be under the law, and thus subject to it, and we would be guilty. And then we'd have to stand before God and make our case, and plead our case. That ought to be interesting. But you see, because grace has been given to us, then grace is the desire to do God's will, according to Philippians 2.13. And Paul's prayer was that grace would be multiplied to every Christian. That the desire to do God's will would be so abundantly clear that we would want, out of love for God, out of receiving that grace, out of receiving that mercy, out of receiving that loving kindness that's been poured upon us by the Holy Spirit, we'd want to run out and do God's will. And that's where... Chuck Smith in his book, Grace Changes Things, and why a lot of teachings from Calvary chapels are all about why grace causes you to want to do God's will. Now, I love the teaching. I doubt the result. My problem is, is that there are those that abuse grace. I personally believe for those that receive grace, they do change. Out of love for what they've been forgiven, they choose to go forward for what they're living. You hear? You understand that? Out of grace for what they've been forgiven, they go out 
to demonstrate what they've been living. In other words, they're giving grace because they've been given grace. They're living grace because they've been given grace. Get it? Got it. Good. In other words, you get it to live it, you give it, so you prove it by what you're doing with what you were given in the first place. And it's not about head knowledge or some kind of like, you know, intellectual kind of, you know, oh, I got grace, so ha ha, I'm saved, you're not tough, sucker. No. It's about, hey, look, you're common with every other sinner in the world. You've been brought into an equality of humanity. Everyone, all have sinned and fallen short of glory. The great humanitarian socialistic statement of all time was there, there by God. You're all sinners. You've all failed. Not one of you. No, there is none righteous. No, not one. Period. The great equator is the Bible. It leaves you all and every one of us guilty before God. But then the great enumerator, or in, well, enumerator is the word. The great enumerator of God is that he has caused us, because we've been given that judgment, to seek to rectify in some way the resolution of a conflict that we're in to get the benefit of something that we should be given so that we can solve the problem, which is grace. So when we know how guilty we are, oh baby, <laughs> we don't want to do that again, so we want to do God's will more so than we did before we even realized how much we were out of God's will. And that's how loving kindness or the love of God draweth men to repentance. It's that love of God that not only causes us to change our ways, but to choose from going our way to His way, from turning from the left to the right, or in this case from the right on my right to your left or my left. So the point has always been there that God has given grace to us that we should extend grace to others to do His will and that's what the will of God is to give grace for grace. How do we receive this grace? There's only one way. Crunch! <laughs> God desires a broken contrite spirit being humbled. It's interesting that we say we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift us up. No, we really don't. When we acknowledge the fact that God is crushing us, then we're being humbled. But more often than not, you're going to find that people really don't humble themselves. The genuflection of the redirection of the outward manifestation of someone humbling themselves is simply, you know, to make the posturing, you know, like, you know, you know, and to bow down, or to open the hands, or to close the eyes, or to put the hands together, or to clasp them together. In some way, to reveal that you are submitting yourself to a higher authority, to someone over you that's of greater importance than you are. And Jesus did something the opposite of that in order to demonstrate that. It wasn't so much about how I was seen by what I was doing, but what he did for someone else. He washed their feet. Because the feet were the dirtiest part of the body in those days, and that would be the part that you know would get dirty regularly, and that only a servant would wash people's feet, and so he said that was the way to humble yourself. Now, obviously, we have ceremonies today that you know don't really show or manifest themselves the same way, but the intention is what's there. And so, true humility, or the humility that God wants of us, causes us to be broken and contrite. And that's usually from the realization of just how sinful we are and how much we're thankful for the grace we've been given. You see, humility comes from realization, not from activation. You can't cause it to happen in your life. It's created in you by the Spirit of God. It's a fruit of His Spirit that will be made known through the breaking thereof or the changing thereof of a person's heart from the stony heart that it started with to a heart of flesh. And the only way to really make flesh tender is to pulverize it. And that means to beat it, to stab it, to bloody it. Yeah. It's a pretty graphic description, but that's the way that it works. You take knives and you just kind of put the meat in between and you pierce it through and through and it gets tenderized because it has all kinds of substance to it 
and you want to be less of yourself and more of him. That's why it says to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow him, because once you've been crucified, you're pulverized. And that's why we take up our cross daily, to be crucified, not to be glorified. It's not about our glory, but it's about being humbled ourselves so that his glory would be made manifest, that we would be giving grace in the same way we were getting grace. And so it is about humility and humbling ourselves, but being more so humbled by God to accomplish his will and not our own. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6. No, nothing is more humbling than experiencing conflicts we cannot solve. I like cliches. I like the idea that some people run out there and make this one cliche that God will never give you something bigger than you cannot handle. And I say, no, false, not true. God will. People say, well, you know, God, if he gives you something, will give you the way to do it. No, false. It's not true. Well, you know, if God opens the door, he wants you to go through it. No, not true. If God closes the door, he's got something better in mind. No, not true. There's a lot of cliches that are used to, to describe one portion or one point in time that someone experienced something similar to what the cliche is, but not what the Word of God says. And that's where a lot of people mistake cliche for scripture. I'm sorry, but passe Christianity is cliche. And a lot of people in tabloid Christianity live by what people say rather than what the Bible says or the scriptures say. And you can't do that. Your faith will never grow. You'll always be emotionally unstable and you'll be tossed to and fro not knowing what it is you're going through and why. Because it's to change you to make you into his image so that you would experience and understand what the grace of God was for and why it's been designed for you to know him in a more intimate way so that you would be able to share him to others who need to know him in a more intimate way. When we are given a problem that we cannot solve, when it's beyond our means without any measure of our capability to resolve it, when it goes beyond our comprehension and we are flabbergasted to the end of our logic, the end of our means, then we cry out, usually, to God. And that's when God says He delights in a broken and contrite spirit because once you have something bigger than you are, once it's greater than you are, once you can't solve it and you can't do a thing about it, then you'll turn to God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You will be humbled right where God wants you to be. And that's what he does in great conflict, in great issues that you cannot resolve. That's why not everything will be solved as some Christianity will teach you. Sometimes God doesn't want you to resolve it at all. Job could not resolve his own situation or circumstances. He could rationalize it. He could logically defend it. He could interpret it. He could make an application of it. He could do everything that a normal man of God would do and still does to this day. But he could never satisfy what was really going on in heaven. The conflict between God and Satan. He had no realization of that. No knowledge of it whatsoever. He was blessed in the end of his travail, but not going through it at the time of what he thought. The same thing is true when you face death. You know, doctor walks in. Oh, well, I got bad news. You only got three weeks to live. And you automatically... Oh my God, what am I going to do in three weeks? You know, i got to get my house in order. Well, hello. You know, Jesus said, thou fool, you know, tonight thou soul be required of thee to the man, rich man that was going to do something about his life. You know, and we should all be prepared to meet the Lord at any time, much less, you know, like three weeks. But let's just say that, you know, you were given three weeks to live, you know, and what kind of conflict is that for you? It's like a shocking wake-up call to smash you in the face. And you, you don't know what to do. Do you run out and automatically seek cures? You know, well, I'm going to you know, increase my vitamin intake. Well, that's a little late. You know, I'm going to change my way of living. Oh, you know, you know, all these little things are kind of like, okay, you know, kind of negotiation and bargaining. But what really should you do when you are smacked in the face on the right hand? Turn the other. 
See what more you can get out of this trial. See what more you could experience of this conflict that you cannot solve. God, what are you speaking to me? God, what are you telling me? God, what worse thing do you want me to go through? And how do you want me to deal with this? I know that a lot of people can't think that way when they're first faced with death. I happen to have been one of those people that when I first got saved, I was faced with death immediately. And it was like, I was ready <laughs> for whatever stupid reason because God wanted me to teach in the end of my life. But I was told that I wouldn't live past 30. And I think I'm a little older than 30 unless, you know, I just got gray hair from just, you know, I kind of, I don't know. <laughs> I think I've been around for a while. But almost doubled my age so far, you know, and that's twice as long as what the doctor said I would live through. And so the amazing thing is that not only did I live longer than what they said, I lived better than what they said. As a matter of fact, I was healthier than what they said. God can not deliver, but God can choose to uncover and reveal what it is that He wanted me to understand and get the biggest benefit out of this problem that I faced. And that benefit was that he gave more grace. You see, there was nothing I could do. They had already reached the end of their circumstances of medicine, that they tried everything they could. It wasn't working. Nothing was working. Matter of fact, they got to the place where this last surgery that I had quite a while ago, they said, we don't know if you recover from it. <laughs> I almost didn't. You know, stubborn. But they had exhausted their venue of everything that could be done for me. You know, and... Finally, they just gave up. You know, I said, there's nothing more we can do for you. And God did. God could. And I never lost my cookies over it. I said, well, all right, Lord. You know, you want to take me home early? Hey, I'm out of here. You know, I was like, cool. You know, and I was pretty at peace with it. And so because I was at peace with it, then God said, you've learned everything you needed to because I was very humbled. I was humbled to the point of there was nothing left of me but devastation. And God took me and resurrected out of those ashes, created a life that he could use. Prior to that, pretty messed up. Some would say still am. <laughs> but you see, it is this very experience that God uses to break us of our pride and to bring us down to the level he wants us to be so he can give us grace. That grace will be the prompting of God's spirit to accomplish the next four benefits that God intends for our problems. In other words, God has to first use the benefit of getting more grace and the way he does it is by breaking us and making us humble so that he could go and take us through learning how to incorporate the other ways of the benefits that we could be drawing from our experiences in life of the principle of that problem we face and why we're going through it because God wants to give us grace and he wants to give us more grace so that we would understand what grace is for, be able to use grace for what it was meant to do, be able to apply grace where it should be liberally spread about and to comprehend what the differences are in the grace that other people talk about as opposed to what God does and gives for each and every one of us to experience as we go through the problems that we face. Because it's never a problem that God says you're always going to solve. It's never a problem that God says you're always going to have rebukable circumstances where you just rebuke it. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Or I declare that I'm healthy. Well, that's nice, but what did God tell you to do? I mean, if God doesn't want you to declare it, shut up. Quite frankly. If God wants you to go to the doctor, go to the doctors. If God wants to break you through this circumstance, then be broken. I've seen a lot of contemporaries of mine, pastors now, that have gone through, at the beginning of their life, you know, health teachings that they would say, oh, you know, don't take aspirin, you know, pray, you know, oh, yeah, okay, I pray and take aspirin, you know, I mean, <laughs> go figure, you know, I practically live on four excedrin a day, you know, I mean, that's because, quite frankly, my body, <laughs> mess that it is, it lives off of those four excedrin, you know, I mean, just, I don't get the benefit of four, I probably get the benefit of one, but because of dumping syndrome, it goes right through me and I don't assimilate or take into my body the majority of that. But because it's needed for you know my blood system and for my circulation, all these other things, you know, arthritis, that I'd be going, you know, and I've been off Excedrin at times, but for the most part, you know, it's like, well, you know, there's a benefit. It's like God said, okay, fine, do it. So the point being is, 
God said, so you do. And that's why he gives grace. Because he applies it to you at the time that you need it. The pastors that taught about health and healing and all this stuff about living your life according to some measure of, you know, healthy eating, sleeping, drinking, and whatever you're doing, it's true. In a lot of ways, that will benefit you. It's a consequence of these actions. And that's what the teaching should have been. But there's also the reality of, with the rest of the story, there are times where God wants to crush you so that he could give you more grace than just grace for salvation. He wants to give you grace so you'll be tender and loving. Even as I felt at this recent juncture in my life of making another course correction in my life about some areas I've been dealing with, you know, because, you know, quite frankly, I can find fault with anybody. You know? <laughs> and do. No, I'm kidding. That's a joke. I know some of you are out there going, yeah, you sinner. <laughs> yeah. I know, I got you. <laughs> got you. Got you and your sin. <laughs> you know, but, no, some people think that, you know, I'm like the ultimate convictor of sins. It's like, no. I just see in you what I already got. And it's so obvious to me that that's my sin. I go, ha, ah, you turkey. I've been there, man. Stupid. <laughs> you know how dumb that is, man? I've already tried that. It don't work. You know, and I'm just one guy telling the other guy, hey, I know what you're doing. <laughs> you know, don't pull the wool over my eyes. I've been there. I've committed every sin there is. I think I'm the chiefest of sinners. If there ever was a person who the extension of grace, you know, that if you could frustrate grace, I would have been it. Well, God ain't frustrated yet. Please. But using grace as the applicable means, God wants to crush us of our pride bring us to the humility so that at the age level where I was ready to receive it, then I could teach it of the grace for grace that he's extended to all those around us, that we should be manifesting the grace of God. And to others at times where we were saying, you know, that ain't right. You know, we, you know, it's okay to observe and see things that you say, well, that ain't right, but not to beat them down with it, but to just say, that ain't right, and you go the other way. And that's what I do. It's like, hey, you know, false. I just go the other way. Someone asked me a question, well, why did you say false? Well, because it's false, you know, that's why. Here's why, and that's it, boom, I'm gone. You know, and I'll point you to Jesus and let you go your way. You know, if you want to follow the false, follow the false. I don't care. It's your choice. You'll learn. <laughs> Been there, done that, don't like it. <laughs> Tasted it, ooh, no, taste not, touch not, want not, no, I'm out of the other way. But that's why grace has been given to us, because the contemporaries that I grew up with, the pastors, as older men of God, were crushed by some great devastating act of humanity upon them, whether it be cancer or some disease or some conflict or whatever it may be, they were challenged to the very core of their faith so that they'd have more grace. And so you see, that's why the reality of God leading us sometimes will take us to the place of being crushed by our problems so that we would get a benefit out of them. Because the grape is nothing as a fruit, except to be eaten as a fruit. But when it's crushed, it becomes a wine. And then it's savored through time. And it becomes a nectar in God's eyes, as far as what He desires for our lives to be. That those can taste and see that our life was good, and that God had created in us a life to be manifested of the grace that it was given. Even as, like we say, God shed his grace on thee to America. Well, the truth is, not just America, but that song should be sung to you and me. God shed his grace on thee and me. Because you see, as we go through these problems, really, it's all about grace.